Our guest tonight is esteemed researcher, Dr. Carolyn Tully, who is a pagan witch and archeologist, my favorite combination. Her professional work has included researching Bronze Age Minoan religious culture, but also ranges to Golden Dawn, Thelema, Egypt, Egyptosophy, and Egyptomania uh, in the early 20th century, and that favorite pagan bete noir, Aleister Crowley, and lots of other things. So much to talk about. Uh, welcome. Good evening, Dr. Tully who's coming all the way from Australia. Thank you. We're so grateful. Yes. Thanks. Thanks very much for inviting me, Holly. And hi, everyone. And yes, it's 10 a.m. in the morning here on a Sunday. So that's a quite a good time for me because the last thing I did uh, that involved an overseas audience, I had to get up at like 10 to 5 a.m. And I was like, why did I say yes, I would do that? So it's, this is a very cushy time for me. So yeah. thanks for coming, yeah. everybody. That's great. So, Caroline, <laughs> if I may, um, I'd love for you to jump right in this evening. And uh, we're all curious to hear more. You've published some on your research in Crete about Minoan Bronze Age religion. I know I'd like to hear more. I want to know, so was there really a snake goddess uh, like the cute statue I have in the next room? and uh, some things about that. Okay, well, yes, yeah, so I'll just, show you, I'll just show you my book. So I have a book um, which is called The Cultic Life of Trees in the Prehistoric Aegean, Levant, Egypt and Cyprus. But I've got a lot of, this is a quite an expensive book because it's an academic publisher. But on my um, Academia EDU page, I've got quite a lot of free articles, a lot of which come out of, you know, the content in that book. So basically, Minoan Crete. So was there a snake goddess? Let's kind of look at that first. So the thing is with Minoan Crete, the, any, any allegedly supernatural beings look a lot like human beings, so in visual art. So, for example, they all wear the same types of clothes as human beings. With the snake goddesses, they, um, we, don't, we don't really know if they're goddesses, let's put it that way. Uh, they could be human women performing as goddesses, and I'll get on to why that might be the case in a minute, um, or, or they, they might very well be goddesses. So um, in Minoan Crete, there's no, there's no statues, like say in classical Greece or Roman Egypt, there's no statues of deities, there is, um, or, or what, what we all agree are deities, there's a pair of ceramic feet uh, that may have come from a wooden statue. They were found in a cult place uh, at, in a tripartite shrine uh, on, the, on the flank of Mount Yuktus, which is the main um, peak sanctuary of Knossos, the palace at Knossos. There's also an ivory figure of a, a very like finely carved ivory figure of a, um, a young male who, and it's about, it's about two feet high and, and that could be a deity but the thing is like for example with Egypt you know the deities you can tell who's a deity because they've got something either on their head like Isis has a throne on her head and things like that or else their their head itself is you know distinctive so you know Thoth has an ibis head but in Crete any alleged deities just look the same as what you know as humans and they're wearing the same clothes as well and one of the ways you can think um, possibly distinguish deities is if they're surrounded by powerful animals, for example, uh, griffins or lions, or they have also these really big dogs, um, that could be an example of a deity, or if they're hovering in the air. So I can show you an image if I'll just share my screen. Now, hang on, where is it? Share screen, hang on. So uh, Egyptomania. I'm just going to find some images that show the difference, but no, oh, hang on. Can you see that? Can you see that on yeah. my screen? Yes, okay, hang on. cool. Let's have a look. So, um, wait a minute. Uh, oh, oh, okay. So, for example, um, I'll just go full screen. So, for example, um, 
So here we have some, these have been interpreted as goddesses, as women. Some people go, oh, well, these ones are women and this one's a goddess. But then you can see up here, there's a little hovering figure. So this is an image of what's called ecstatic epiphany. And that's thought to, that these, all these hovering things are thought to be visions. And these are thought to be human women that are having this, um, you know, visionary experience. And then down here we have what is called enacted epiphany. And so this, this is a, like a little shrine structure, and this is a female figure sitting on that. And in my opinion, it's probably a human female figure uh, who is performing as a goddess. And pagans would be quite a, you know familiar with that type of activity in regards to invocation or aspecting or even possession. So having the deity enter into you and you're performing it, but you're you, you know the deity has come into the human body, whereas here um, the, it's thought that the deity is, you know, outside of you and you can see it in the air or maybe in your, you know, in your imagination or whatever facility. So um, I'm just trying to think of another example of where something is um, possibly um, a, a, a good example of it, someone who's a deity, who's thought to be, okay, so here we have, um, okay, again, uh, this very well-known, gold oh, I'm just moving away Whoop. so this gold ring uh from uh, Mycenae this figure is interpreted as a goddess sitting under a tree and then these are human women bringing her um flowers and things like that that that's actually hovering in the air and there's two little girls behind her but you can see she's really just wearing the same outfit as these and there's not really anything that says she's a goddess but in Minoan archaeology being seated is a sign of authority, especially if you're seated, um, like seated on an altar structure like that, or if you're seated one behind with a, something behind you, like a sacred tree or something like that. So that's thought to be someone performing as a goddess, or if it is a goddess, you can't tell the difference, really. There's nothing particularly distinctive about her garment. Like she doesn't have, you know, Hathor horns on her head or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that's an example. Um, now I'm just going to stop sharing for the minute. Stop sharing. Um, so that's an example of um, some of the problems in Minoan religion. So, for example, with the snake goddesses, we've got these female figures holding snakes. Um, there's actually evidence for three, but one is the only evidence actually is a skirt. So they were all in pieces and fragmentary and Arthur Evans put them back together and with the the very popular one who's got her arms up like that her face is actually 20th century and the hat she has a beret with a cat on it and there's no particular reason why that beret should go with that that figurine that was just found amongst the um, other broken material in the um the the temple repositories so where those those um um, the snake, so-called snake goddesses came from, they were all in pieces and they were found under the floor in the second palace period palace at Knossos and they probably came from a shrine or something like that that had been destroyed in an earthquake when the, the first palace because Mano and Crete has lots of earthquakes and things are always falling down so the first <laughs> palace um, these cult objects uh, were probably swept into this, like these sort of stone cysts, and then they were sealed forever under the floor of the second palace. So the snake goddesses were in there with little bits of gold foil, little bits of bone, lots of weird red dirt, and, and it was sort of interesting in layers. And, and so they were in pieces. And so when Arthur Evans excavated that, he he hired a craftsman called Halvor Bag, who reconstructed constructed them into what we see now and the and the, the larger snake goddess she didn't have a skirt but there was a skirt in there um in the temple repositories but that larger one her body didn't fit onto there so so certain and and the smaller snake goddess she she was missing her, one of her arms and her face so they reconstructed her face and that's because they thought that was the right thing to do back then. But now we know when you reconstruct things, they have to be done in a different colour and they have to be reversible. So it has to be obvious that this part is reconstructed and this part is authentic, et cetera, say with a vase or a figurine or whatever. And um, so that people can see 
what's what. And also it has to be reversible because in the future, someone else might come up with a better form of reconstruction or a different interpretation. So it has to be able to be undone. And one of the problems with Arthur Evans's reconstruction, he reconstructed a lot of the palace at Knossos um, and he used cement and metal and it's really stuck on the ancient palace and you actually can't get it off. So you can't reverse his construction. But again, he thought he was doing the right thing. Also, he owned the site. He had bought the site. So he owned it. And um, my supervisor, Louise, loves to say, you know, Palace of Gnosis, best example of Art Deco in the Mediterranean, you know. Um, <laughs> and a, a lot of the public don't because the signage doesn't really explain which bit's reconstructed and which isn't. So and now I've gone on a bit of a tangent about reconstruction, but that was, yeah, so trying to answer the question about um, are the snake goddesses goddesses? Well, the whole problem is in Crete, we don't know from the evidence what is a goddess. And the yeah. script, Linear A and Cretan Hieroglyphic are not translated. So Linear B, which... Um, Linear B is the script of the Mycenaean Greeks who came in and took over Crete in the late Bronze Age. And they used the Cretan script linear A to, to write their own proto-Greek language. So we linear, linear B was deciphered in about something like 1953. And it, we found out it was Greek, but linear A, but the Minoan script and the Minoan language, linear A and Cretan hieroglyphic, they're not translated and they can't be translated until enough mm -hmm. examples of the script is found. I don't, I'm not really a linguist. I don't really know the whole, you know, why that is, but apparently you need a certain amount of a language to, um, to be able to decipher it. So they can work out what some things might say because it looks like the linear B sign say for example like you know textile is a square with a little bit of a fringe with a line across it mm -hmm. you know in linear b they can go well that's probably textile in linear a but they don't know what language the minoans spoke and they don't oh. really know what the what the linear b sounded like so we don't have um we don't have textual evidence from crete and also linear b the greek script it's all just things like shopping lists it's like you know Take take 50, um, 50 amphora of oil to the shrine out past Pylos or, you know, we have 100 sheep and we need to, this many women to spin the wool. So we don't know if, even if linear, B, linear A or Cretan hieroglyphic are translated, we don't know if they're going to tell us anything other mm -hmm. than um, these are the crops, you need to take them here and things like that. We don't know if they're going to be helpful. So we have to use images landscape and architecture and comparative examples from different regions to inform us about Crete. So that's why Crete's a bit of a problem. So <laughs> yeah, I um, immediately recognize because I'm into Egyptian ancient images, the tree thing, but your book, isn't it about that whole uh, tree goddesses or, or apparent goddesses all through the Levant? Yeah. Yeah, there so, are images of Hathor and uh, somebody else, you know, coming out of a tree or reaching out. Yeah, of a tree. yeah, Nut, Nut. That's right. Um, yes. So that's that's a great topic, and that's why I actually did my PhD because I. Uh, so this is another long story. So let me try and start. Okay, so in the biblical text, there is mention of an Asherah, and there are also mention of objects called Masavot or in um, singular, Masaba. And they are, well, they know that the Asherah was a tree and we know that Masavot was some sort of stone. And um, when the Ugaritic texts from Syria were discovered and deciphered in, I think it was about 19, that sounds too early, but I feel like it was about the, in the late 1920s. Um, they realized that, so because in the biblical scholars are always going, oh, the Asherah, it's just a tree. It's not anything else. It's just a tree. And, and people are going, well, why did they have a sacred tree? What's that got to do with um, biblical religion? Anyway, the Ugaritic texts showed us that Asherah was actually the name of a goddess. And so because Syria 
well, Israel, Lebanon and Syria, in the Bronze Age, they were all just called Canaan. Uh, they were the Canaanites. Um, so it's thought that Canaanite religion, one of its, and even Near Eastern religion, um, there's a sort of a tradition of sacred trees that are actually animate um, with like a, either a spirit or, or even a female, not always female, but a deity within the tree. Uh, and then there's these sacred stones as well. So it's called, it's, it's this sort of an iconic, um, it's not really an iconic, an iconic means no image. It's theory of, uh, no, it's a physiomorphic. So physiomorphic is the image of nature. But anyway, it's kind of called the an iconic tradition. And there's Nano Marinatos, who's a well-known scholar of uh, Minoan Creek, she suggests that that cult of uh, sort of trees and stones, sacred trees and stones spread, spread out across uh, the Eastern Mediterranean and was also evident in Crete. And there's all, all this image of, of sacred trees and stones from um, Cretan um, imagery. And Arthur Evans, the excavator of Minoan Crete, he originally tried to explain this by looking at the biblical text and saying, well, you know, maybe this is what that ash, maybe we can explain the Minoan images through the Asherah and the Massabot in the biblical text. Um, but the biblical text is actually far too late. So the Minoans were, you know, uh, uh, you know, almost a thousand years earlier than the biblical text. So the biblical text is kind of the latest example of that, or not the latest, but if he'd known, he would have looked at earlier material. So the, the, tra the tradition of sacred trees and stones appears in the Levant. So Israel, um, Israel, Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, much longer than it does in Crete. And it, so it appears earlier and it lasts much longer. So it's actually, there's actually much more evidence over there. Um, so we don't even know if that's what the Minoan images do depict, but because there's thought to be this so-called koine or common language of, of religious sort of belief in an animate landscape um, in the Eastern Mediterranean and Central Mediterranean. Um, that's just one of the interpretations of Minoan tree and stone cult. Um, and it's a really, 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 really fascinating topic. And yeah, you mentioned those Egyptian examples. So there's these fantastic um, tomb images. Sometimes they're paintings, sometimes they're like sort of carved in stone of goddesses coming out of trees and pouring water, giving pouring water for the deceased and they're drinking this zigzag water. And sometimes, so sometimes it's a fully anthropomorphic, sometimes it's a goddess standing in front of a tree in the Egyptian examples. Sometimes she's growing out of the tree. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just a breast and an arm coming out of the tree. And so again, you know, Egypt was extremely influential in the ancient world because it was huge and it was very long lasting. And so a lot of, you know, it could have been, you know, we don't know, it could have appeared in Egypt first, but these are very, pretty, pretty much underworld um, images or not underworld, afterlife images. So yeah, it's all kind of, it's, it's blurry. It's all kind of, we're having to speculate from this sort of um, pan Mediterranean or Eastern Mediterranean evidence of, of, of what is happening in Crete. Yeah. So yeah, I love. I, I thought I was originally going to do a PhD on the Israelite uh, examples, but my supervisor Louise Hitchcock is more of a Minoanist, and she, so she goes, "Okay, this is what you're going to do. You're going to look at Crete, and you're going to compare it with Israel and Cyprus." And I'm like, "Okay." <laughs> so I actually had to do far more work, you know, to do that. That was yeah. actually a little demanding. Well, yeah. I've got a question, Caroline. Uh, Mary Jane asked, I wonder if the figures of women sitting could be high priestesses. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, and Nano Marinatos also thinks they were, you know, either elite women or queens, because the thing is, a lot of that artwork is actually from the palaces or from palatial administration. So it was, you know, administrators or other people working in the palaces and doing trade and diplomatic, you know, correspondence. So it was their imagery. So could be queens, um, could be, yes, certainly could be priestesses. Often the, the queen was the high priestess and then there were sort of, um, you know, lower level priestesses. Um, definitely, absolutely. So it wouldn't just be any old person sitting on that are uh, those stepped altars, which in my opinion are architectonic versions of mountains. Um, 
so I, another thing with that seated figure, it may be influenced by the Mesopotamian mountain goddess Nin Hostag, because a lot of those step structures are, um, well, look, I'm just going to bring up another image. Sorry, I've just got to share my screen again. This is one of my real interests. Okay, PowerPoint, shamanism. I think that's the one. Uh, I just got to find an example of, where's that thing? Can you see that? Yes. Hang on, where's the, just got to scroll down to the step structures. Okay, so, well, first I'll look at this. I'll go, so Crete, Crete is very, oh, what happened? Oh, come on. Why is this not working? Sorry, wait a minute. This is Zoom, you know. Okay. We're all good. So Crete, Crete is very mountainous. So this is this is the Palace of Festos. This is the central court. The central courts of the palaces were often aligned on sacred mountains. So this is Festos aligned on this sacred mountain here. And Crete has lots of caves and um, where am I going? Oh, yes, all right. So, and this is, you probably know this seal image with um, a female figure standing on top of a mountain. We know that's a mountain. It, that's actually a Near Eastern mountain design. It's called the scale pattern. And you can see also she has powerful animals on either side. And then there's a male figure doing the Minoan salute, but his head is kind of obscured because the seal is broken. Um, so the landscape, I believe personally, I believe the Minoans were animists and um, you know, people are still animists. Animism is kind of actually a very sensible and normal response to the landscape. Mm -hmm. And anyway, in regards to the step structures, a lot of Minoan cult structures are stepped. Um, there's several different types of altars. And here we have, um, this is a really nice one. It's a bit hard to see. This is an ivory lid of a box. And I personally believe the stepped structures are architect. They're like sort of abbreviated versions of mountains. That might sound a bit kooky, but um, that's what I believe. So um, now I can't remember what you actually, what the question was. What was the question <laughs> that you asked me? Well, yeah, we, somebody asked about high priests. Oh, no, someone else, yeah, someone else about and, the high priests. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Somebody has asked about uh, the Akshini in Indic traditions? Is oh, that something you're familiar yeah. with? Yeah, like uh, coming out of trees and pillars. Yeah, actually, I read a fantastic, there's a, well, it's, I think it's about Dakinis, um, a study, and one of the things said someone was standing in front of a building and he felt tap, tap, tap on his shoulder and he turned it, and it was a wooden pillar from the building and, um, and a, you know, a, a tree spirit had come out and, mm -hmm was tapping him yeah so that's another interesting thing about um about Minoan Crete is that buildings are thought to be animate because just because trees have been cut down and stone has been cut and it's been turned into a palace or other built structure it doesn't mean it's dead or anything it was probably thought to be animate so that's really interesting and there's you know there's these certain structures inside the palaces like pillar crypts and things um, and they have offerings around them as if maybe they were trying to they were feeding the palace or something like that you know uh, yeah so definitely um, I believe the Minoans had an animate sort of perception of the world and that they and that also that they conversed with with these deities and what's really interesting to me is how you know, whether they, um, how did they converse with them? Did they kind of hear it in their head? Did they, was there some sort of language that priests and priestesses knew? Like, you know, um, the um, the cult site of the Oracle of Zeus at Dodona, it was a sacred tree. And uh, we don't know whether the priests and priestesses there, they just heard, well, it's thought that it was the wind blowing through the trees, but did the priests and priestesses hear that as a language? Was that some sort of they could interpret this wind sound or or was it actually birds? Um, were they talking to birds and things like that? So it's really, really interesting. That's my yeah, you know, kind uh, of favourite trajectory. Yeah, and um, I'm sorry to keep going back to Egypt, but as you talk, I'm remembering, you know, there was the um, 
what was it? A pe the piece of wood that got put into uh, a palace, a royal palace in Biblos, and then Isis went there in disguise. Do you remember that story? Oh, yeah. There's an yeah, old... Yeah, that's um, when Osiris... There's another one about a sliver of wood that gets inside somebody. So that seems to be kind of ubiquitous, doesn't it? So uh, let yeah, me... Yeah, um, so that was... Go ahead. I was just Caroline and I established oh. earlier that we've got a bit of a <laughs> lag, so forgive us both if we uh, cut each other off. I was just going to say, yeah, so that Biblos example, so Biblos is in Lebanon, and that was from the story, the myth of Isis and Osiris, so when Seth killed Osiris and cut him into pieces, um, or maybe it was when he uh, different, I don't know if he's cut into pieces in this example, but he ended up in a bit of wood and the king of Biblos put that pillar in his palace and so again there was this bit of architectural structure with this animate sort of deity inside of it I can't really remember what happened then but yeah so I, I'm totally into the 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 animate um I love it that's and why why I think that really interesting also is because I feel Minoan religion also that any sort of like um animistic sort of angle from ancient religion is very informative about how we can kind of cope with I think helping humans now especially when like neo-pagans would be at the forefront of this but you know maybe other humans will get on the get on the boat as well but you know helping us to really relate to the uh, the natural world um, and I'll just sort of interject here and say I've noticed since COVID, like before COVID, the environment was like a hot topic. Since COVID, everyone's like, what, the environment? Oh, what's that again? It's like people don't have forgotten. They're just like, oh, no, humans, we're threatened by COVID. It's like, hello, what happened to the environment? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let's backtrack a little bit because you um, go into a good bit about how uh, um, Fraser, James Fraser and Ellen Harrison affected how Europeans looked at all of this and of course that's been what a hundred years or more since then and uh yeah I'd like to hear more about your take on European perception yeah. of the work you're doing now well actually mm, it's actually um at the hundred year anniversary of the abridged version of the golden bow um so that's interesting. Now I've got a sign saying my internet connection is a state. Is um, am I frozen? No. No, not yet. <laughs> okay, because it was. Uh, I keep getting this thing saying your internet connection is unstable. Anyway, so um, James Fraser, The Golden Bough, was the most unbelievably influential book. In my opinion, if he hadn't written that, there'd be no contemporary magic or contemporary paganism. The, you know, things like the dying and rising God, um, although there is a sort of a dying and rising God in the Near East, Baal, um, just that those structures, if you actually look at Wicca, it's almost like turning the golden bough into a religion. There's the fire festivals, you know, mm -hmm. there's the, 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 the male and female, uh, the, the, the males, you know, the, the gods that fight at winter, the holy king and the whichever other one is because I'm not a Wiccan so I can't remember um, it's it just, Fraser is just so influential so Fraser I guess the thing is with Minoan religion what Fraser influenced is the idea that there was a great mother goddess with her dying and rising son and some Minoan archaeologists still believe that actually because it this is all going to be in the you know this thing that I'm doing next week um I'm just talking to Cosette over there. Um, the problem is, as well, you know, I've sort of explained how in it's hard to determine who is a goddess and who is a god in Minoan evidence. So there's been a long period of, of Fraserian interpretation um, in Minoan religion. And it's, you know, some people still totally interpret it that way. And that it, it could be correct. It could be correct. It's just that there's other, um, you know, there's problems with that and there's other possibilities. So, yeah, but Fraser, I mean, I love Fraser. It's one of the first books I read in my, um, you know, when I was studying magic because I was reading 
Alistair Crowley, so I think I was reading Magic and Theory and Practice and or one of his books and it said, it, he said, read the golden bow. When you read the golden, he said something like read the golden bow and you'll understand everything. So I was like, oh, great, because I really do want to understand everything. And so I got my friend to, who worked at a bookshop to order me this, this, what is this book, The Golden Bow? And she ordered, actually, I've got it here. This is the very version that I got when I was 19. I don't know if that's a bit strobey. Anyway, it's a very beautiful. So this is, you know, the abridged edition. And I spent a year reading it, reading it, because I was like, oh, great, I really want to know, you know, Alistair Crowley said I'll know everything after this. Um, and I, when I'd finished it, I was, I was kind of disappointed because I really felt that I didn't know everything at all. In fact, I was a little confused at quite a lot of the content, but, um, and I've never actually been able to read it again. But, um, yeah, so Fraser was just super influential um, and also, well, you know, I'm kind of talking about Ronald Hutton's research here, but, you know, if you read the chapter um, on, find, I think it's Finding a Folklore in Triumph of the Moon, he explains how Fraser's intention was to sort of equate, subtly equate Christianity with these sort of so-called primitive beliefs about dying and rising gods without overtly saying so, because Fraser was very anti-Christian. And he it the golden the public so um on the one hand kind of that also happened but something happened that fraser didn't intend which was instead of people being a little bit haughty and um you know going oh yes how barbaric these customs were in fact people went oh this is all really exciting let's go and search for more customs so it actually kind of revived a real interest in you know folkloric activities especially in england which mm. is you know folklore central so yeah so uh, and then jane ellen harrison she was a classicist so she was studying ancient greece and she um because she was a woman you know she had feminist consciousness and she also um was quite interested interested in looking at um the bronze age which was you know minoan religion um, minoan and mycenaean religion because it was thought to be well a more goddess oriented but also it was thought to be much more ecstatic and free in contrast to very sensible classical religion even though classical religion is not very sensible there was this you know scholarly idea that the greeks were you know everything's white you know because they didn't really know that the artworks were painted and everything's white everything's very sensible and very masculine um, and Minoan religion when it was first discovered it was thought to be ecstatic everyone's on drugs they're all just dancing it's all very feminine what's going on it's crazy so Jane Ellen Harrison was um, she was just really an early scholar of, of, of that sort of thing and she went to visit Arthur Evans at Knossos and you know they kind of um, you know, had interesting discussions. And the thing is with them is just that those authors, because they're from so long ago, research has found new things and is a little more sophisticated. And so although they're those two authors, Jane Ellen Harrison and Arthur Evans, are, are, oh, not Arthur Evans, um, James Fraser are fantastic. Um, they're just outdated. Like, um, you know, anthropology has... Um, really moved ahead or well, actually Arthur Evans was really kind of he kind of created anthropology but it's very much become much more sophisticated since his day and Jane Ellen Harrison um, we've found out a lot more about the character of of Bronze Age religion even though we still don't know a lot we found out a lot more than when she was um, looking at it so if you use them as sources you've got to remember that they're they're dealing with what they knew back then and what they believed and their own cultural positioning as well. And we've kind of got a similar issue in, when we uh, jump forward to um, people like Carol Christ and some early uh, or earlier feminists who um, pulled, in, pulled this into uh, contemporary pagan awareness. And, but we're still under perhaps the misimpression that everything was matriarchal and um, the great goddess stuff. Do you want to say anything about that? And, yeah, where, sure. and where we come to now? 
So in, my, in one thing, Crete was interpreted as matriarchal because there's a lot of images of women. They thought, oh, it must be matriarchal, but we've got a lot of images of women in society now. Are we matriarchal? No, we're not. So using images as evidence is a, you know, we can only speculate about what was going on. Um, yes, so second wave feminist, the goddess movement is, you know, extremely empowering to women and um, fantastic, but... I think, again, they were, you know, say, for example, Merlin Stone's book, When God Was a Woman, they're just a little, um, you know, they're just a little outdated in regards to, um, to interpreting the evidence. And I've found having, trying to have discussions on, on the internet, which of course, you know, through text is terrible, hard to discuss, but there's a bit of a sort of a angry, resistance to new information um especially if it but that's the same thing with everything within paganism um you know we think things are a certain way but new information comes in and you have to kind of either process it or ignore it um so you know we don't know that crete was matriarchal yes carol christ did lots of goddess tours if minoa and crete i think another thing is though i think you can have a religious experience whether something is historically correct or not. So I don't think, in a way, I don't think it matters whether Crete was matriarchal or not, because we're not living in ancient Crete anyway. Um, I think, yeah, so I think you can have, you know, Jesus, what comes down to us about him is, has, is a lot of it's not historically correct, but people have very personal relationships with this being and things like that so um I think you know I think history and archaeology history is history but religious experience I don't think it necessarily has to be married to that I think history can inform that and you mm -hmm. can go oh, well you know I want to be super historically correct so I'm going to do this or you can go you know I'm more experienced I, I'm more interested in what I'm experiencing myself or I want to just invent my own belief or whatever there's, I think there's, especially today, less rules in regards to sort of religious experience. So, um, yeah, I think um, there's been pagan resistance to research on paganism because of this sort of going, oh, well, you know, poo, that's not true. That's just, you know, that's been out, that's outdated and things like that. But um, I don't think pagans need to kind of be married to that history. I think it has been destabilizing. I, I do understand that it's destabilizing. Actually, there's someone who's recently written, her name's uh, um, Ezra Rose, and she was recently interviewed by Pam Grossman on The Witch Wave. And she has recently written this Jewish critique of Western magical use of Kabbalah. And it's, it is quite disorienting. You're going, oh, what, whoa. Yeah, because we knew, yes, of course, we knew it was um, from Judaism and mystical Judaism, but her critique of sort of this Western use of it is, is like quite destabilizing. And I've never come across um, ceremonial magic magicians really questioning that before. So that's interesting. Um, yeah. So I was destabled by, destabilized by that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so speaking of um, ceremonial religion, talk to us about uh, Golden Dawn and uh, yeah. I'll okay, well, I'll let I've you. Got, I got some more pictures for that. Oh, actually, I'll have, oh, to, um, have to do share screen. Where is my share? Oh, here it is. Share screen. And yeah, that's it. Oh. I will just say, you and I were speaking earlier about the tension between um, so called scholars, I say so called, between scholars and pagan practitioners. And for example, there are a number of comedics among Egyptologists, but they really stay on the down low <laughs> because it's um, perceived to uh, diminish their work. And I imagine that other groups have encountered this too. Great yes. pictures, I'll shut up. Yes, because in, at least say for example, in anthropology or in, in writing about religion, you're supposed to be methodologically atheist. Yeah. And it's thought if you're a member of a religion or uh, that you can't critique it and you can't discuss it properly, although a lot of, uh, in at least Christian um, kind of religious studies, they are often 
you know, actual Christians. And, and pagan studies has been criticised because people go, oh, you know, you're just apologists for pagans because, you you know, you're all pagans yourself, so you can't study it impartially and things like that. So Egyptologists, you know, a lot of archaeologists would think it's, like, extremely eccentric for s- someone to actually want to believe or even consider believing in these things. And I'm not really sure why that's such a terrible thing. Um, anyway, so for example, here, so here we have, you know, some members of the Golden Dawn. We have McGregor Mathers and Moyna Mathers in Egyptian costume. There is McGregor Mathers down there. Um, William Wynne Westcott, Egyptian sort of lotus. Well, it's not an Egyptian wand, but it's an Egyptian spired lotus wand. Alistair Crowley in an Egyptian-ish outfit. Florence Farr, Unfortunately, she's in more of a Greek outfit here, so she wasn't really in an Egyptian outfit. Now, why are they doing this? I'll have to just go back to, first I've got to explain why this is an example of Egyptomania. Now, where is, oh yeah, escape. Hang on, I've got to go back to this. I'm just going to explain Egyptomania because this is where, this is kind of the root base of all this. So Egyptomania, I'm going to read out a quote because I think this is quite helpful. So the terms Egyptomania, Egyptian revival, Nile style and pharaonism all describe a single specific phenomena. The borrowing of the most spectacular elements from the grammar of ornament that is the original essence of ancient Egyptian art. However, Egyptomania is more than just a simple mania for Egypt. It's not enough to copy Egyptian forms artists must recreate them in the cauldron of their sensibility and in the context of their times, or must give them an appearance of renewed vitality, a function other than the purpose for which they were originally intended. So Egyptomania uses, copies, rethinks, and recreates forms derived from ancient Egypt. Nourished by symbolic meanings attributed to ancient Egypt, although unrelated to their actual meanings in antiquity, Egyptomania has survived by offering new readings of these forms passed down through the ages. So Egyptomania is inspired by pharaonic Egypt, which is the the pharaonic period. So that's from about 4000 BCE up to 31 CE when Cleopatra killed herself. Um, So Egyptomania is inspired by the pharaonic period in Egypt by its art, architecture and religion, but during the process of the reception of ancient Egypt, so the the consumption of ancient Egypt uh, by people, you know, looking at it, it's modified. And this can be a case of accidental misreading or of deliberate modification, and either way the result is characterised by its absence of strict historical accuracy. So... um, Egyptomania. So the Golden Dawn did, where are they? Golden Dawn, where are you? Here you are. Uh, So the Golden Dawn, you know, okay, now this is a, I've got to go back to Rome. So at the end of the Pharaonic period, um, you know, the Romans took over Egypt after Cleopatra and Mark Antony committed suicide. And the Romans and the Greeks who kind of already were dealing with Egypt, they didn't bother to um, write down the hieroglyphic, you know, hieroglyphic meanings or the Egyptian language. No one bothered to record it. So by about 395 CE, you know, after Christ, which is a pretty long time, that was the date of about the last Egyptian, uh, you know, hieroglyphic inscription. So people had forgotten what hieroglyphs meant. And they couldn't read, so they couldn't read Egyptian language. So they had to rely on Greek and Latin information about Egypt. So Greek and Latin never went away, but hieroglyphs were forgotten. And they weren't retranslated for another thousand years until uh, about, I think it's 1824 that Champollion, or 1826 that Champollion deciphered the hieroglyphics. So there was a lot of things that weren't quite right, you know, because they were, weren't coming from, it wasn't coming from Egyptian evidence itself. We didn't really know what the Egyptians themselves thought because we couldn't read the the hieroglyphs. So the hieroglyphs on the one hand were thought to be um, symbolic of all these, it's a phonetic language of their phonetic signs, their sounds and determinatives sometimes to sort of um, explain what the sound is. Um, 
but people thought they were symbols, you know, and so there's all these efforts to try and understand them as symbols and that they were very magical. Um, and, you know, they didn't really understand Egyptian art either. For example, in um, ceremonial magic, there's this, the sign of silence. Um, it comes from statues of the child Horus or all Egyptian children going like that, but he's actually, it's really the finger in the mouth. So it's actually the sign of a, of a child rather than um, a sign of silence. Anyway, so the Golden Dawn, so, and so Egypt, because one of the books, you know, we didn't really have great history for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years and people, um, you know, the main book was the Bible and the Bible kind of talked about Egypt. So they thought, oh, Egypt must be the most ancient civilization. And this was before the excavations in Mesopotamia. Um, you know, and understanding the Near East, um, you know, the ziggurats and the, um, the, the Assyrians and the Mesopotamians and the Sumerians and all that. And so people really didn't know about that and they only knew about Egypt. And so Egypt, over the centuries, it developed this fantastic reputation, which it still has, to be the um, source of all um, religion, knowledge, um, magic and law and, um, you know, the source of ancient wisdom. And this sort of was in, you know, secret societies um, and um, hermetic, you know, writings, uh, the hermetic magical tradition. It was in Freemasonry and things like that. And, of course, the Golden Dawn came, was founded by three Freemasons. So William Wynne Westcott, Samuel Liddell McGregor Mathers and William or Robert Woodman. Anyway, he's a kind of the boring one who you never really hear about. And he died. <laughs> He, he died, um, he was quite old, so he died, you know, not that long into the Golden Dawn. And, of course, so what I think happened, so, so you know, they all loved Egypt. Uh, Westcott had a library and a lot of the members went and looked in the library and that consisted of sort of um, the latest actual Egyptological research and what is termed Egyptosophy, which is the more... Uh, historically incorrect tradition of, of um, Egyptian, uh, you know, the interpretation of Egypt. And uh, so they just loved Egypt. They thought it was the super magical civilization. McGregor Mathers and Moyna moved to Paris and started a, a cult of Isis, which is really, really interesting. And that's them there, um, you know, in their Isis. And uh, again, you can criticize, you can, you know, you can, I've got, a, I don't think it's, publicly accessible but I've got actually no I do have it on my academia page where I kind of dissect their garments and I'm, I'm kind of criticizing their garments and you know it sounds really bad and mean when I say I'm criticizing but I adore the golden dawn they are they are our ancestors if it wasn't for the golden dawn we wouldn't be all in the magical world now and they're our ancestors but I'm from an Egyptologic so when I criticize them I'm coming from an academic Egyptological angle and I'm I'm kind of dissecting what they did and I'm criticising it, but that doesn't mean I don't totally respect and love them as a, you know, magical forebears. So they had a cult of Isis. Florence Farr had this um, relationship with a mummy, which is still in the British Museum. And if you ever go there, it's it's a very well-known one. It's, it's, it's all, it's, it's, um, oh, it's hard to explain. It's all wrapped in cloth. It's from the Roman period. It's... Um, it's even got wrapped fingers and everything. Anyway, that's still on display, but the coffin that it was in is not on display. And the coffin, uh, so the mummy's from the Roman period and the coffin is from the, it's from like, you know, like about 1500 BCE. So that's much earlier. So why was that mummy in that coffin? Uh, they used to think it was because when the dealer from Egypt sold it to the British Museum, he just put it in that coffin. But it was now Christina Riggs, who's a uh, Roman Egypt expert, she thinks it's because this particular type of Roman, well, actually, Roman, uh, the Roman period mummies, they often did just steal coffins from, yeah. from uh, they, just, they would just tip people out. The so Egyptians did that was, too in the late period, <laughs> yeah. It was cool to uh, yes, so there, other people's stuff. There's just so much stuff there. Yeah. Anyway, so so Florence was in this. She was in this sort of psychic communion with a priestess of um, Amun, a chant a chantress, as in a singer of the god Amun. But it was it. She thought it was the mummy, but it was 
actually the coffin. So she thought it, the coffin belongs to the, this priestess called Mut Emmenu, but the mummy that was in it was not Mut Emmenu. That was actually a Roman period mummy, and it's actually a man, although he's the way he's padded. He actually has boobs, but they've x-rayed him and that it's a man. So he could have been some sort of exotic dancer or we don't really know what he was, what his job was, but he had terrible, terrible tooth decay. So he probably ate a lot of cakes. Anyway, he's still on display, um, but Mute Menu's coffin is in storage. I've seen it and photographed it and it's not very exciting. It's a bit of a boring coffin. So no wonder they don't display it. Um, and then uh, who are, so Crowley, in my opinion, what happened was with Crowley's, um, um, channeling of the book of the law is he realized that um the superiors in the golden dawn were you know au fait with egypt and had these egyptian sort of connections so you know mcgregor and moina with isis florence with this mummy that was kind of manifesting in sort of an astral form and crowley went to eat and what the problem is he'd been he'd gone through the first um three or no the first four degrees and he was qualified to go into the second order because he had a terrible reputation Florence Farr and the other people who were responsible for allowing him into the higher degrees they said no we're not going to initiate him he's terrible and and so he went oh god and so he went to Paris and got Mathers to initiate him and they all the London group are going what the hell why you not and they they all had a huge fight and it just caused more trouble and then Crowley you know um he went to eventually went to Egypt with his wife Rose and you probably all know the kind of story of the book of the law um there's lots of um, books about it and I've got an article on the, my academia page about it and he um, you know, he got in allegedly in contact with um, the god Horus and he was led to the Cairo Museum to this particular wooden grave stele, which allegedly, um, you know, was the key to this whole thing. Cut a long story short, Crowley was, you know, the, the prophet of the new Aeon and, um, you know, it made him super important. And a lot of people think he still is super important. So I believe that part of, I'm not, I don't necessarily, you know, I'm Thelemic. And so I like his cosmology, his Egyptian style sort of cosmology uh, of those gods. Um, but I don't believe he is infallible. I know a lot of, um, let's call them, we won't name names of the magical orders, but one of the most prominent magical Crowleyite order, you can barely criticise him without people just going, oh, you know. I mean, I don't think he's 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 just a man. He's just a man like all of us, um, you know. Anyway, so, um, yeah, so I believe he, I believe they all used Egypt as one because it's interesting in itself, but two, to support their own importance and magical authority within the their group situation so that's um and and when we, i you know in regards to egypt ammonia mania being historically incorrect you can see that crowley you know this nemesis that's not really what a nemesis looked like only pharaohs really wore this you'll see you know this on all sorts of people in paintings and you know european paintings it's just wrong 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 this leopard skin um and also mathers has a leopard skin that was a particular type of priest i think it's called the sem priest yes. um yes. you know this this is um this outfit is really um um what's the period the really um, much more like from Ak the akhenaten's period if you see it closely it's that pleated you know that very pleated sort of diaphanous dress it's all historically oh and mathers has on his head he's got this sort of cap and it's got a side lock and you know of course that's really just a hairdo for children but he had this sort of mystical um symbolism of you know um well he said in an interview he goes yes the side lock of youth youth wisdom is always young and he would just make stuff up um, and that's fine to reinterpret it just don't say it's history that's all you know sure yeah. you know use, use egyptian material if you want just don't say that that's history so you know, i'm just going to stop sharing with that I'd love to know if uh, Howard Carter had any inkling of all this stuff, because, you know, we're coming up on the 100th anniversary next month of the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb. And 
It was a small British world. Yes. You know what? I actually, I don't know that much about Howard Carter or because I've tend to look mm -hmm. at things. Um, I tend to look at Egyptomania before the discovery of um, Tutankhamun, except in regards to Art Deco, which was obviously after the discovery and very influenced by. So I don't know that much about Carter, but um, I do, I did read a book about the curse of the mummy, um, basically de debunking it. And again, people, people want that thing, want it to be true. But if, you know, if, if Tutankhamun, if it was, if you're going to be cursed for opening a Pharaoh's tomb, you're going to be cursed for opening any Pharaoh's tomb. And, you know, so many of them are opened, um, but there's a fantastic book about the Pharaoh's or the mummy's cursed by Robert, uh, Robert Luckhurst. I think it's Luckhurst or it could be Roger Luckhurst. Anyway, his last name is Luckhurst. It's a fantastic book. So, yeah, so no, I don't know that much about um, Tutankhamun um, and I don't know that much about Howard Carter and his ideas about magic or anything. So mm -hmm. sorry about that. Yeah, well, and he was um, he was pretty much a commoner. And uh, my understanding is that most of these uh, early... Golden Dawn and uh, Crowley and uh, followers were more, um, uh, well, at least uh, middle upper class, if not aristocracy. Is that right? So they may not have really had that much connection. Yeah, I think, well, I think some of them were kind of, well, middle class. Mathis, McGregor Mathis certainly had, um, aspirations to be an aristocrat and um, invented his own aristocratic title which was the Comte of Blanstray. I think also in regards to Howard Carter's um, social status that was also a problem for him in within archaeology because he was really a draftsman and then through a certain fortuitous circumstances he ended up being able to do excavation and and then he ended up excavating that that you know, find of the century, um, Tutankhamun's tomb. So, yeah, also by the time he was doing that, the Golden Dawn had turned into something else as well because, you know, they it really, the, the original Golden Dawn really disbanded and then Mathis died in 1918 from the Spanish flu and Moyna came back to England and I think they other people were running it and they renamed it also because there was that big court case where um, there were these two swindlers who duped Mathers into thinking that they were, I can't remember what, but like incarnations of gods or something important. But he 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 blabbed out, um, he kind of blabbed out secrets and then they then blabbed them out and they were caught these, it was Madame Horos and her boyfriend Theo. And they <sighs> they were like some early examples of those manipulative, weird sex sort of um nutbags, you know, under under the guise of occultism and and there was some sort of big court case and it all came out and the gold because the golden dawn was secret out doing Macy. it was a secret society doing so Macy. Um, when it came out into the public it, oh. they just looked like lunatics so um they renamed themselves and stuff and so by the time carter was excavating that tomb he would have if he dealt with any of those magical people it would be under like the alpha and omega or um the stella machetina i can't remember because i don't know that much about the later incarnations of the golden mm -hmm. dawn yeah mm -hmm. well we've got about 10 minutes left caroline so talk to me about what you think that this stuff says to contemporary pagans today hmm um well i i do lean on the side of I'm quite a fan of pagan reconstructionism, which is that it was a bit of a trend in the early 2000s with the with the Yahoo email lists. But since the advent of social media, it's kind of disappeared. So pagan reconstructionism is the attempt to practice historically correctly ancient paganism, whereas neo-paganism really descends from the magical tradition and the Wiccan sort of format of, of, of the casting the circle and um, the pentagrams and all that, whereas ancient paganism was not about casting the circle with pentagrams or anything. It was, you know, altars, um, offerings, um, sometimes if you are lucky, deities manifesting to you and other things. Um, what, so I would say the ancient world has a lot of fantastic material that is, can be, you know, you can 
kind of do it historically correct. You can use it as a sort of a springboard to sort of create new stuff. The thing is, we're not ever going to be historically correct because we are post-Christian. So we have, you know, this huge gap, centuries and centuries of, 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 of um, you know, also technological advancement and all sorts of stuff. We can't go back to the past, but I think we can look at aspects of it that are really interesting and, um, you know, bring them into our contemporary practice. And um, a lot of people are like, oh, but I can't get access to this and that, um, you know, um, the material, but there's tons of stuff on the internet. There's also a lot of people publish, just give away their, their research on um, academia, edu. A lot of academics, of course, are not friendly to pagans. Like I was recently at a conference on shamanism in Borneo and I met uh, Neil Price, who's that Vi that Viking expert. He's written The Way of the Vikings. And a lot of people, a lot of heathens use his books to inform, um, you know, their heathen practice. And he said to me, he said, he's just not interested. I said, what do you think about how everyone, you know, loves your work? And he said, I'm just not interested in contemporary paganism. I'm not interested in, I'm only interested in archaeology. I'm not looking at them. I don't really want to talk to them. I, I'm, I don't know why they want to do this. And I was kind of quite quizzical staring at him because I'm quite used to, you know, contemporary paganism and why, because I was a pagan before I went back to university. I just went back to university to inform as, as kind of study because my paganism has always involved study, study, study and learning interesting stuff. Anyway, he, you know, he's not a pagan. He is a Viking expert, but he has no interest in dealing with pagans. And he was even a little bit disturbed. He's going, oh, you know, I see a lot of people on Instagram and they're wearing these Viking outfits. And he goes, especially women, he said, a lot of that comes out of my books, but they're just reconstructions. I um, mean, he's like, I'm worried people are spending all this money, you know, getting, making these Viking outfits, but they're, you know, they're just reconstructions. And he, he really couldn't bridge the, um, and didn't want to bridge the, you know, he's got all this fantastic information and these people who are the heathens might kind of want to use it and find it very exciting. He just finds it weird that people would do that. It's, he's just not interested. So a lot of academics are not um, interested or they'll treat pagans like, oh, look at the funny religious people, you know. Oh, aren't they, aren't they weird and they're into our thing? Oh, I see. Um, so there's some very tippy-toey sort of um, articles by some Aegean archaeologists are like, oh, there's some pagans that are into Minoan stuff. Isn't that funny? Um, they're not like rude or patronizing, but they just, they don't really know what paganism is and they don't really know why people would be interested in that. And it's just something else um, that they're not, they're not used to. Yeah. So, yeah. So in my case, because I come from a pagan background and went to university to find out originally about Roman religion, but I got distracted onto other things. Um, some uh, people kind of go, oh, she's an academic. It's like, what is an academic? It's just someone who does a lot of study. It's not like a, you know, an evil weirdo. Um, yeah, so, so well, I would say well, academic research is, it's just it's just you know getting really 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 into a topic <laughs> you know I think that may be where um Christianity bless its heart as we say here uh led everybody astray because uh it got into this thing of being the arbiter of history and science and religion doesn't have to have anything to do with either of those but our our western culture is really accustomed to thinking that it's important for things to be historically accurate and scientifically accurate uh and so we say that it is and then when it turns out that wasn't really the way it was in uh uh Crete then it, it disturbs it destabilizes our spirituality and I think pagans are, are really positioned to handle that kind of destabilization better because most of us nowadays understand that it's a living, changing tradition. And 
it's okay to have um, to be a participant observer. Yeah, and the thing is with Crete, it's um, as, as as a particular example, as opposed to something like Egypt, where there's far more information, including texts. There's you know. Egypt has got tons more information than Crete. The thing is with Crete, it's just to know that these certain ideas are not as um, concrete as we may have been led to believe. And there's a lot of other interpretations and, and uh, people should just be aware of that. And um, mm -hmm. or, or they don't have to be. Now, <laughs> yeah, so Marcus said she changes everything she touches and everything she touches changes. Yes, and the only thing that doesn't change is that everything changes. <laughs> Um, now, there's a whole lot of questions. Do you think I should have a look at those? I, uh, oh, there's a new one. Um, don't you think that being a pagan researcher brings a big insight into what the artifacts are used for? Mm. I do. I do in that sometimes when I hear about um, academics talking about ritual, especially ritual involving pagan deities, I'm like, but you've never done a ritual, so... You know, I might have not have done a historically correct ritual, but at least I'm kind of know about doing rituals. So I do think, um, I think, yes, in that way. Um, okay, now, so I'm just going to have a look at these questions. So, so wait, I'll just go back up the top though. So, um, okay. Yeah, so, some good comments uh, too. Everybody be sure and look in your chat box for those. Uh, Yates, yes, Yates. Um, Yeats is fantastic and, um, you know, the whole Irish tradition and also what he did with, he actually did these, he invented these really fantastic Irish initiations um, that are really hard to get um, inspired by his Golden Dawn sort of thing. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, hang on. Chipping concrete out of a lower courtyard. Uh, yeah, that would make me laugh because you know there there was this Belzoni character, the very first Egyptologist, who was basically a circus entrepreneur. And he went around, he poured concrete into everything, and he blew up some stuff with dynamite to get it open. Totally destructive. Uh, of course, this may have just been stuff that got built on top of old ruins. I don't know. In, and then Osos. Yeah. Um, and then Joe says hidden masters. And so, yep. Well, the thing is, the, I mean, the Golden Dawn was was allegedly, um, you know, informed by the, the hidden masters or the secret chiefs. So that's a really fascinating um, kind of thing. Now, but don't you think, oh, yeah, big insight. Okay, Marker has said that. It's fascinating. So, since so much of religion begins as a revelation in the first place, yes, an individual has a numinous experience, insight, and then shares it. Well, that's the thing. I, I think religion is another thing. And there's ancient religions, but the study of them archaeologically or historically is a different thing, although it can inform, but it's a different thing to the experience of a religion within the, the self. So now Cosette says, um, Cosette says, we seem to know so little about the religion of Crete. Is there anything that pagans are drawn draw on? Absolutely. Uh, but you are coming to my workshop next week, which I can tell you. But the evidence for Crete is images, the glyptic. And so you can look at that. Um, all the glyptic is the Minoan seals and ceilings. So the gold rings and stone seals, which were used to imprint um, document uh, you know clay that um, verified documents or goods being brought into the palace or whatever and there's 11,000 images in glyptic so uh, there's frescoes there are you know a few little there's there's actually there's metal statues from mountain peak sanctuaries there is clay statues from mountain peak sanctuaries of humans and animals there is the cult site so there is mountain peak sanctuaries, there is um, uh, rural sanctuaries down on the ground or on the side of a mountain, and there's cave sanctuaries, and they're all still there, and you can go and visit them in Crete. Uh, there's also urban sanctuaries, but of course, a lot of the stuff that was there is now in the museum. So you've had, like, if you go to the site, there's just going to be the site, but then you've got to go to the museum and look at all the stuff in the museum as well. Some museums have, you know, a lot more easily accessible stuff. Some people, some museums have digitized their um, collection. So that's really helpful, but the Heraclean Museum in Crete has not. 
yet. Mm. So, um, but yeah, there, there's tons of um, evidence to look at. There is also, you know, the text, you can look at linear, linear B, which is the Mycenaean texts. Um, there's a lot about religion in that, but it's not really so much about the character of the religion, but more like deity names, like some of the Greek gods are mentioned in linear B. And it's like, wow, that means they're really old, etc. Um, okay, now Joe says, um, do you think it's significant that two griffins surround the throne? Yep, uh, definitely. Definitely. So griffins primarily, so griffins are those winged, you know, you know what a griffin looks like. You probably saw the hippogriff in Harry Potter. Anyway, so griffins um, are on either side of the throne of Knossos. Griffins primarily in Minoan art appear on either side of female figures. So that's one of the arguments as to why a female may have sat on that stone throne. That stone throne, it has a wiggly back as well. And that is one of the um, type of abbreviated ways they drew mountains. So I, me and my friend Sam have written an article about this. We believe that throne was another one of those mountainous thrones. So there's the stepped ones, um, which I believe are like an architectonic mountain. And then, then there's the wiggly back, um, also called Batilic throne. So because a lot of the Minoan Batals, sort of have this sort of it's like a, just a, like a little bit of a bumpy mountain shape so I believe the Knossos throne was a probably a female figure sitting on a mountain inside the palace so bringing the peak sanctuary mountain peak sanctuary ritual into the the palace so bringing you know the cult site that was outside symbolically into the palace um yeah, and so um, Evans, so, so Joe also says, it's also been pointed out that the throne is wide as if for a woman's hips. Yep, Arthur Evans um, thought that. Uh, who else? So now, okay, I think we had, a, oh, yeah, Wendy Griffin, <laughs> academic dean um, of Cherry Hill. Yeah. What is remember lives? Is yeah. That time yeah. Okay, so that is, I think I've gone through all the questions now. And I think it's just about time for us to let you um, let you go for the evening, for your morning. But we're so, so glad you could join us, Caroline, and glad for all of you that were able to be here tonight. And uh, please, uh, if you don't know Cherry Hill, go to cherryhillseminary.org and visit us. Um, and shout out to Cosette, who used to do our social media and, and other communication stuff. Thanks so much. And um, we will have another coming to the center in either January or February with Ronald Hutton. Oh. Uh, yeah, it'll be 10 years since uh, he actually came to America and came here to Columbia and did a symposium with long? us. We, we collaborated with um, the University of South Carolina Archaeology Department, which was totally awesome. Uh, so he's coming back for the 10th anniversary with us. And uh, we'll announce others later on. Say so what, Maka? 10 years. I can't believe it. I know. I know. It feels like yesterday. I was putting on the shirt uh, the other night, and it's all raggedy. And it's what I wore in all the pictures with Ronald and Wendy and some other folks. <laughs> and I thought, well, okay, it has been 10 years. Anyway, that's enough about my wardrobe. Thank you again. I will be posting this recording. I know there were a lot of people registered who couldn't be here at this time. So uh, we will put that out on our website and on our social media. And if you somehow miss it, just write us chs at cherryhillseminary.org. All right. And thank you. Good night. Thank you. Night. See you. Okay. So we hanging up now or not? Uh, let's, no.